Hi everyone, thanks for joining today's session. My name is Arno, I'm an architect at Microsoft, and today we're going to talk about the cloud adoption framework, and especially how the landing zone using Terraform can allow you to unlock DevOps, new ways of working, and new ways of innovating in the organization. So if we look at the cloud adoption framework for Azure, this is really taking you uh, throughout all the steps of innovation in the organization. So from capturing the business need, capturing what you are trying to achieve with your cloud adoption, and then taking the first step into the, the planning and then uh, going into the technical step, like ready, where you get your landing zone, when you get ready to migrate, when you get ready to innovate. All these steps are detailed there, and all these steps are actually iterative uh, motions that you're doing inside the organization. And throughout all of these steps, you capture, you develop, and you implement things around the governance and things around the security. That's all part of the core skills that you are going to develop. So you can find all the details about the cloud adoption framework on aka.ms slash CAF. And there's a lot of recommendations for all the different areas that are presented here. But today, we're really going to spend some time on one particular focus, which is the ready area and how do you innovate and how do you make things happen in the cloud? Because very often we see customers like, we love your recommendation from uh, Microsoft. Thank you so much for the recommendation. But how do I get from recommendations to reality inside my systems, reality working in inside my environment. And this is really what Cloud Adoption Framework Landing Zone uh, for Terraform are. And it's really not only taking the landing zone as it was historically. We see that when you're doing landing zone, very often we hear that as a way to deploy the guardrails, a way to deploy the audit accounting information uh, and the policies to prevent some un unnecessary behavior or un un uh, desired behavior. And this is totally right. What we believe is that you're going to deploy uh, this new technology. You're going to make those new controls happen in the organization. You're going to do that. Probably you want to take that opportunity to change things, to make everything uh, happen. And the landing zone, not just delivering the guardrails and the controls, but also delivering value. So what we really believe is that the mechanisms that you would put at work to deploy your landing zone should come in a continuity with the way you're going to deploy solutions. So if we look at the technical perspective, from the foundation, from the ground up, to delivering the solution and unifying the processes of innovation inside the organization. Ultimately, it's for you enabling new ways of working inside the company. And when we mean that, we mean not only infrastructure as code, which we see very often referred to, but we believe that everything as code is the way to go. Because really, the guardrails, the controls, are coded, there are policies, Azure policies that you have in your organization. But as well, the way you deploy your application and the way you slipstream the innovation from the foundation to the DevOps team doing the application innovation, that should be same, similar uh, mechanisms. And of course, when you're doing everything as code, you have all the advantages of DevOps, which is having everything being tested, being validated many times. So before a change hits uh, production, you have uh, this code has been tested many times into uh, UAT, into dev environment, into the sandpit for the engineering. So that's really high quality code that reaches uh, production. And this code is everything inside the organization, as you mentioned, from the policy to the way you're going to deploy your app service environment, your uh, container services, and describing also all the way up the way those containers are going to be uh, deployed inside your, inside your environment. And there's really uh, a significant improvement that you see uh, in organization going deployment uh, with this method. And really what it means at the end of the day is that since everything is code, everything would be living inside the code repository. So GitHub, uh, Azure DevOps, or any other uh, code repository, Git repository that you want, that will become the source of truth for your deployment, for your organization. So that's what really everything is code. That's really what we hear about. And when we're talking about code, you know, uh, Microsoft Azure, we are an open cloud. And of course, you would expect uh, uh, us to give you the best recommendation, the best sample and best uh, tools with PowerShell, ARM template, and Azure CLI. And of course, this is what we, uh, what we do, but always uh, uh, embracing uh, the ecosystem and other uh, uh, technologies that are your choice. So of course, Chef, Puppet, Python, and Siebel, those are things that we see on the market and that are uh, very uh, present on Azure on which we're doing a lot of investment and we're seeing our customer working on. 
What we also see is that uh, a clear momentum using uh, Terraform. So Terraform is really another investment that we're doing as part of Cloud Adoption Framework with not only giving you the first party, but also artifacts that you can leverage directly out of the box on Terraform with best practices. And not only best practices that I was mentioning before, but artifacts that you can leverage and that you can use inside your organization. And we're gonna talk about this concept of inner sourcing in a couple of minutes. So what does it take to do a landing zone on, uh, on Terraform? Well, first, there's a stain point which should be clear, which when you're migrating to the cloud, you don't want it to be just another infrastructure project. And that leads us to think back around the plan stage I was talking a little bit uh, before. If you're going to Azure and you're thinking that you're going to Azure to reduce your TCO, that's fine. You can take your virtual machines from the data center and put the virtual machines inside Azure, and you will have a lot of benefit uh, out of that, the security, the TCO being one of them. But I think also what's important is changing the way you are operating and changing the way you are deploying stuff. And this is really what we've seen being most beneficial for our customer is taking this opportunity to work with new method. Maybe not just taking only VM from one point to the other, but look at all the automation that can be done on those VMs deployment technique, on the control plane of Azure, which is how do I deploy the virtual machine? What are the uh, parameters for the network interface cards and all the stuff, but how do I automate all of that? How do I industrialize all of that? That's really important. That's really where it's not just an infrastructure project. If you want to make the most out of this investment, it's really something that goes across multiple disciplines. And this is really what DevOps is all about. What it means, collaboration between the teams. What we've really seen is that um, into a way that we are uh, adopting uh, DevOps, there's no more this uh, behavior of not in my backyard. There is still clear responsibility. Networking team is still the networking team, apps team is still the apps team, and platform is still the platform. However, what we've seen happening is that since everything lies in a code, it's much easier to collaborate. It's much easier to work based on facts rather than feelings. So this is really what we've seen happening with our customers, working on that, collaborating on the code, collaborating on the configuration into a much more inclusive and collaborative way. And as I was mentioning, that happening from the ground up, from the policies, from the infrastructure fundamentals, to the way we deliver application, and even to the configuration of how those applications are going to run for instance, on my uh, Azure Kubernetes Services cluster, on my app service environment, et cetera, et cetera. So that's really a very important step of this cloud journey and something that we enable out of the box with the landing zone on Terraform. Now it has consequences. As we mentioned, it will be a way for you to optimize your operations. And a way that uh, is changing your operation is that GitOps is becoming the operating system. Now, what does it mean? Uh, GitOps is a bit uh, overrated term, and you can see ma as many definitions as people you would ask uh, a definition. But really what's important is that a Git repository becomes the source of truth of your enterprise configuration. And meaning that then around that, you will have a set of pipelines, a set of techniques that will make sure that this configuration is applied. And what it means also is that you are sure that there is one source of truth, which is the, uh, the Git uh, configuration and the Git operations. Now, what does it mean? It means that my operations are gonna change. It means that I might not go in the portal or let's rephrase it. I will go to the portal when I wanna experiment stuff. When I'm in the engineering sandpit and this is the first time I'm playing with Kubernetes, maybe it's cool, I'm going to go to the portal. I'm going to play around, discover the, the nodes that I have here, the buttons that I can push. And this is fine, this is part of the discovery method. But when we are going from UAT dev test uh, uh, to a production, we don't want discovery stage and we don't want to risk having a button clicked or not. We really want to have everything being automated, validated into the different environment. And this is what it means, GitOps. It means that you will take your configuration file and will be validated by different set of pipelines. It will be promoted to different tests uh, uh, environment. And once it reach production, it has a very high level of uh, quality. And what it means is that for, for the ops team, yes, instead of promoting a change inside the organization by going to the portal, it will be a change, same thing, that will be coming with new mechanisms. 
and those new mechanisms are the mechanisms that we use in software uh, engineering for years now. And it will be uh, doing a pull request, again, a specific branch of the code, having this pull request being validated by the pipelines for their uh, quality, but also being validated by people. So you will describe uh, gates and you will say, OK, this change would be uh, uh, validated by the pipeline. And once it has been validated by the pipeline, then someone still must approve that change for this to be promoted to the different environment. So this is the way operations are changing. And it's a super collaborative and super inclusive way. We've really seen customers uh, uh, loving this new way of collaborating together. And also an advantage of that is the end-to-end -end traceability and visibility it offers you. Because when the Terraform uh, operations are running, when the Git uh, uh, operations are running, you see exactly what change has happened at which time. And you see exactly what was the result of the pipeline and what was the result of the uh, uh, validation by, by a human. So there's very much more precise things, much more precise operation. And same thing, when you do this, you know, we all have this... Uh, change management meetings where we are discussing and sometimes we know more or less what's going to be changed, what's going to be promoted. Now the question is much more precise. When you're in this change management meeting, you clearly see, okay, this is what's going to change. This is this code. We know that this code involves this change. So we can take a very informed decision, much more informed decision, I would say. And also multi-cloud is the new normal. And that's also one trend that we're seeing quite uh, strongly now is that how do I manage my operations across multiple uh, clouds? And uh, Terraform is a good way to achieve that because we have uh, skilled people on Terraform that are running on AWS, running on Google, and running on Azure is super fine and super easy and actually much better. So now, if we look at what we're having with the Cloud Adoption Framework Landing Zone for Terraform, really what we've been working on is uh, with a lot of uh, uh, financial services industry, but really there's a lot of things that are... Uh, um, customizable based on your own governance framework, based on how do you want to operate. Most likely, one of the very fundamental changes that we will see from, let's say, interface or portal-driven operations to infrastructure as code-driven operation is that something that we see quite desired by many organizations, which is no persisted privilege inside the environment. What I mean is, when I'm operating this kind of environment, even as an admin, I don't have admin privilege, it means I can go to the portal, look at things, but all the changes would be involved by the CI CD pipeline because we want to go through the quality mechanisms that we were uh, discussing before. And if it still uh, happens, then um, there's, of course, all sorts of controls, all sorts of governance, all sorts of policies that are in place to either log a specific undesired behavior or prevent a specific uh, behavior. So that's really all those aspects that we put at work with uh, the governance and controls. Now, a very important aspect that we've seen with enterprise going uh, through uh, uh, the Cloud Adoption Framework landing zone with Terraform, and really one of the most important uh, uh, aspects that we've seen in that area is the possibility to define enterprise-wide patterns and practices, which means that we know how to deploy an AKS cluster. We know how is the quality uh, gate uh, looking like to deploy an AKS cluster inside uh, my environment? So now if I want to deploy a new workload, let's say Windows Virtual Desktop, I also already have all the software quality mechanisms, means, techniques, and validation gates that I can reuse directly. And the way I structure code, it can be very much inspired for the new technology. So what really we've seen is that kind of pattern, reusability across the organization, uh, using proven artifacts and proven code. And what we've really seen as a very interesting uh, uh, advantage for our customers is that since everything is defined in the code, it also clarifies how the enterprise operates and how I'm also as an enterprise interacting with my ecosystem with the partners. So there's no more like many partners come with different methodology, different ways to promote changes in the organization. The enterprise architectures define the rules. This is how we operate. This is how your code must work. This is how you can comply with how we operate. So it really uh, allows you to standardize the way you operate across your different vendors, across your different uh, industry and solution provider from the different business unit. And all of that, at the end of the day, it also enables autonomy. 
because people know uh, the code structure, know how the way it works, and you can basically uh, have them compose some part of the architecture based on the common engineering criteria that we have defined. So that's what we have, that's what we've seen, and one of the success criteria that we've seen with our customers. Now, enough talking, let's do a little break and let's review together a first demo of getting started with the Cloud Adoption Framework uh, landing zones on Terraform. So let's get started. We have the template that we're going to clone into our own uh, GitHub uh, environment. So here I'm creating my CAF configuration repo. I can put it public or private, and then I can create that. So it, that, so it will duplicate that into my own uh, repo. At the same time, keeping the link uh, as a fork of the uh, original uh, environment. Now we're going to uh, open it, so we could use CodeSpace, but here I'm just going to uh, clone it locally on my laptop. So git clone, I put the repo with the URL in my environment, and then I'm opening that with Visual Studio Code. So code dot, and it's going to open that on my machine. Uh, you can uh, have a look that since we have a dot dev container um, uh, directory into this and we have a configuration for a docker container, we open it in container and what you see is it's downloading, it's pulling from uh, docker hub, the configuration. So it's the rover on your laptop with all the tool sets that, uh, that you need. So we can clone the landing zone logic as well uh, within, uh, within this environment. And uh, now we have the logic and the configuration, so we are able to uh, get started with the environment. So we can export the configuration. Uh, but first, we need to log in uh, into an Azure subscription. So we just do a rover login, and we'll have the usual uh, browser uh, authentication experience. Once we do that, uh, we are going to select the right subscription as well. So AZ account uh, set. And as we mentioned, we have AZ uh, with the right version for you to be uh, to be able to uh, validate that everything is working correctly. And we just have to follow the steps here. The first step is to create the, the launchpad. Remember, the launchpad is our foundation for our environment. So it's going to create the storage account for uh, my Terraform state. And this is where Rover is going to actually help me by uh, pushing the state to those uh, storage accounts, putting the secrets inside the key vault, and into the subsequent command, it will help me as well locating my uh, backend storage for the different TF state and the different level. So here you see the subscription quickly, and uh, we continue the execution of, um, of the environment. So here I've applied the launchpad and I'm going to run uh, it through the different uh, levels. So next is level one, which is uh, foundations. So it's uh, fundamental uh, services. We do an apply and same thing, it runs for a couple of minutes. Then I'm going to apply the shared services and uh, the network. So shared services is about uh, automation account, site recovery, and uh, networking hub is to deploy uh, a topology with two uh, network hubs in two different uh, regions. And this is what we see in the configuration. So everything is defined as forms of variables. So you here see that I'm defining one hub in one region. I'm defining here hub two uh, in uh, region two. So it's all configuration file based. And same thing for the peering. I'm defining my peering between hub one and two, just as a config, no need to touch the provider configuration, no need to do that. That's uh, mechanisms that the rover does automatically for, uh, for you. So that's uh, the execution provided and the execution context that we have. And if we look at the next uh, level, we're going to deploy AKS and same thing, AKS will come with its own configuration where I'm going to read the level here, one level down, I'm going to read the networking hub configuration 
and compose that into my environment. You see that I'm defining here a spoke network, and I'm going to peer the spoke network from AKS to my hub network inside my uh, my central hub um, uh, network that I defined uh, previously. And this can be done within the same subscription, or it can be done also outside uh, into different subscription. So for that, uh, Rover takes a specific argument where you specify the target subscription, and then automatically it will spread out across multiple subscription the environment. So here you see that I've defined uh, here my hub into region one, and we can see that there's the peering with region two already done. And there's also a peering with my uh, spoke network for my AKS uh, cluster. So if we go there, we see that we have our spoke AKS cluster with its uh, NSG and, uh, and subnets. Uh, there's already um, the scale set instances uh, for my uh, nodes and uh, my cluster is um, is here and is still being created as we speak. So this is fast forwarded, but this is really to show you how to create a complex environment with multiple uh, levels that allow you to really have um, an environment that can evolve, that is dynamic. And it's all by starting on the uh, Kafka Terraform Landing Zone starter repo. So this is it, this is how we get started. Now, if we have a little more uh, in-depth look at the different components, what we've really seen is those four main items. First, the landing zone by themselves, which are a composition level, a set of things that we deploy into a certain uh, order, and also a set of stuff that are going to be stored into my Terraform state. We also provide you with a Terraform module. And this Terraform module is very important because it's a unified module that includes all the intelligence of deploying things on Azure and scaling with things on Azure. So it includes some of the best practices, it includes some of the stitching the components together. And using the module over the Terraform standard provider for Azure is really bringing this integration value. If you're thinking about creating your own Terraform code out of the box and bare metal uh, Terraform code from the provider, this is totally possible but you have to work on the composition yourself and this becomes an engineering criteria for you, which means taking this virtual machine, taking this virtual network, taking the key vault to store the virtual machine's uh, secret, uh, adding uh, the, the extension for the virtual machine's monitoring. What we bring with the Cloud Adoption Framework module for Terraform is unification of all those different aspects, meaning when I'm describing a VM, I'm describing the VM and how it links to this virtual network, how this VM is going to be creating its own uh, key pair for the SSH environment, how it's going to create the password, and automatically it creates the password inside a key vault. So you specify which key vault you want it to be doing it. So you know this is all this integration work that we know and we hear from our customer is taking them a huge amount of time and this is what we're solving with the module. And we've been proving that for a couple of months now with many customers, and what we've seen is really a super fast provisioning uh, methodology. So very descriptive language that allows you to scale and describe a complex infrastructure in a matter of hours. So this is really fundamental. Another aspect that we're providing is the Terraform provider for CAF. And you'd be wondering, yeah, another provider? And yes, we use it for one specific purpose, which is the naming convention. And it might sound like a detail, but if you are in an enterprise, you know how much naming convention is not a detail at all. And also one of very important aspect is transitioning from the dev and test to the production. And, you know, we always have this name collision that exists uh, uh, from the storage account, from the key vault, when you're going from dev test to production. Now what we're having is with just a switch with the provider, we're able to say, hey, I'm going to be production, I'm going to be uh, dev and test. So the name in dev and test would be randomly generated and they won't be gener randomly generated, of course, in production. And all of that is done with just a toggle that you specify in your config file. It might seem as the detail, but trust me, when you're deploying things at scale, you'll see very, very fast the advantage of that. And then there's another set of things that we're providing you with in terms of Cloud Adoption Framework Landing Zones for Terraform. And one of them is the deployment rover and an open source state management technology. And really all about that is helping you managing different versions of Terraform. We see how fast Terraform is going. So how do you manage stability across the versioning? 
And importantly as well, how do you manage the consistency of all the dev environments inside your organization? So we'll go in deeper into that uh, in, in just a, a second. But what's important to note is every single of the components I showed you is open source. And we really, really uh, are a strong believer that all of those components should and always be open source and accelerate uh, your adoption of the cloud. Open source, it means that nothing is secret. You can see all of that uh, there. You can see how we do the engineering. And even more importantly, you participate into the engineering. So when we started this uh, journey two, two years ago around CAF uh, Terraform Landing Zone, we were really uh, um, uh, looking forward to that. But I think now what we see really is customers, partners, uh, different teams at Microsoft all collaborating on that. And you can be part of that, meaning you need a feature, you open an issue on GitHub, and you want to work on this feature, you just say, hey, I want to work on this feature, I have, a, I have a fix, I have something for that, then, okay, fine, we do it into the planification, the planification process, same thing. It's a GitHub uh, board where you can see uh, the plan and the project uh, and how we're going to release the feature. And we really believe that this community is really something that uh, is important for enterprises and is really important for us. Now, let me go into a little bit more detail. You see me uh, working into the demo with uh, Rover. And there's a question that always comes uh, into, into that. Should I use Terraform bare metal, bare skin, download Terraform binaries on my machine? Or should I use Rover? And Rover might seem as an over complication at the beginning, uh, especially if you're beginning with Terraform. But what's really important to note is that Rover is actually two things. First, it's a Docker container that includes all the binaries that you need to run Terraform correctly and distributed in a team. And what I mean by that is that, yeah, it's cool to have Terraform on your laptop, but how do you have Terraform on 20 laptops that are Mac, PC, Linux, Azure Shell? It's hard, it's super hard, especially we have new versions of Terraform very often. But more importantly than that, a dev environment for infrastructure as code is much, much more than Terraform. You'll have so many things that you'll need to have. You have your CLI, your Azure CLI, you have your JQ, you'll have uh, maybe your static code analysis tool like Chekhov, like uh, TFSEC. Also, you need to do some operations that you want to mandate before a commit uh, uh, comes into the Git repository. So we come with a pre-commit that allows you to filter, verify there's no private uh, keys, verify there's no secret that you're trying to commit to the repo. So you see, getting an environment ready is much more complex than it looks at first. And this is what we provide with the Docker container, with the rover. So this is the first dimension of uh, the rover, the Docker container that I use on my laptop and on all the team's laptop with the right version of the tools. And rover is also something else. It's also a wrapper for Terraform. Now, what does it mean as a wrapper is that we are enriching Terraform and making things easier for you. Now, making things easier for you, what does it mean? It means reconnecting to the different uh, TF state, connecting to the right TF state at the right time and doing that into a unified way. Meaning that when I'm running my Terraform plan or apply on a particular environment, how do I make sure that I will reconnect to the right Azure uh, backend uh, store if I store my uh, state file inside Azure? Or if I'm using uh, TFC or if I'm using any other uh, CI CD technology, how do I make sure that the transition to those technology are smooth? And here, this is a problem that we see very much later in the phases of development, but it's important to have in mind at the beginning. Because think about it. When you're going to put your form inside CI-CD pipelines, one CI-CD pipeline will have its own set of parameters, its own set of technique, its own set of validation of a particular version. And it, it's good. It's cool. But think about maybe different CI-CD pipelines that you're using. And think also about the transition from the CI-CD pipeline to the local experience. This is something that is hard. And this is why we're using Rover. A third reason we're using Rover is actually this one. Is, you know, from the local laptop experience where I'm using my VS Code and I'm connecting uh, transparently to my Docker container using the VS Code extension, 
I'm running my rover command and my rover command allow me to connect to the Terraform state, apply my set of landing zone, but also the story continues where I'm going to the pipeline. So when I'm, when I'm going my pipeline inside the Azure DevOps or any other CI CD technique, as I was mentioning previously, we're going to call the same rover that's going to connect and get the config file. Now the advantage of having the same rover is the same trace, the same things that I'm going to troubleshoot. And it means for my dev team, much more productivity because there's no more difference and fractal vision of the world between the hands, local hands, and the pipeline. Exactly the same trace, exactly the same behavior. So this is really why it's important. And I know it's counterintuitive to use Rover at first, but this is the advantage it provides you in the long run. So three, three of those advantages, making it easy on your laptop, making it easy on the team, and making it easy in the pipeline. Now, what's the very, very important aspect of all of that is how do we do Terraform in a structured way for enterprises? And this is really, really the methodology that is, that is important and that we developed over years and worked with many customers. It's really this idea of having a structure where every levels will be enriching the previous level and we'll have some levels that are privileged, some levels that are not privileged. So there's, you'll see in a minute, a lot of similarities with what we can see in operating system, which like the kernel mode and the user mode. This is the same exact thing we're seeing with landing zones. So what do we have in terms of landing zone? You'll see inside our repository, we're categorizing a landing zone by levels. And it all starts with the level zero, which we uh, often categorize as launchpad. And it could be launchpad, but it can be many other stuff. What it means at level zero, we are actually applying all the configuration related to the DevOps fundamentals, to the subscription, automation, uh, and privilege delegation work. Hard work super privileged, so very little people have access to that. Then on top of that, you'll have the level one, which is here to enforce all the compliance controls, uh, all the guardrails, and that includes uh, many stuff, uh, including our enterprise scale, uh, another sister project from Cloud Adoption Framework, which allows you to automate all of those guardrails. And it includes also the subscription creation mechanisms. Level zero, we automate the delegation. Level one, we have all the automation to create as many subscription and delete them as much as we need to promote that for the business utilization on top of that. And one of the layer on top of that would be the layer two where I'm deploying my network, my hub and spoke, my shared services models. And as you see here, they're all into different states. And actually a level has many TF states. But when you are reading a particular thing at level two, you are reading something that has happening at level one. This, remember, I was talking about autonomy before. This is really what we are all about here. I'm going to delegate some stuff to happen at level two, but I'm going to compose with things coming up from level one. So when I'm going to deploy my network in level two, I'm going to read the TF state, which is responsible to tell me hey, where is my uh, configuration in terms of uh, policy? Where is my configuration in terms of uh, auditing, for instance? Then automatically I will read and compose that. And I will read means I'm not gonna be able to mess with the configuration one level down. I only be able to read. And I will be responsible for things in my own level, my level two, but I won't be able to damage anything into level one. And this is why it enables autonomy because you're able to compose out of that, you're able to create complex environment and enterprise uh, environment uh, at a very, very large scale. And if we continue, uh, remember we were talking previously, it's not just about the guardrails and the control, it's all about delivering everything with DevOps uh, mechanisms. So now we're talking about level three. I'm talking now about deploying your Kubernetes uh, cluster, your AKS cluster. I'm talking about your app service environment. I'm talking about your app service environment that will be reached out and talking to Azure Firewall or would be talking to App Gateway to publish your application with uh, level seven inspection. So we're talking about integrating all those components together. And the final uh, level, which we call the level four, which includes all the application, it's here describing how we are deploying a specific application. So let's take the example. You've deployed many app service environment into your organization maybe across different availability zones with different settings, then you'll have at level four something that describes and automate all the consequences for this application being deployed on this particular app service. 
So this is how we do the structure and the hierarchy of those landing zones. But if we look also, what's important is the way those things are being deployed. And how they are being deployed, you see here at each level, we have a reference to what we call a compute node. And a compute node could be a virtual machine. It could be a container by uh, Azure Kubernetes services or by uh, Azure container instances, a container that is run. And when this compute object, container or VM is running, it's running using an MSI. And where is it running from? It's running inside Azure. So that's what is very interesting for many of our customers that are regulated. They say, this is fine, but all my deployment of my cloud environment, I want it to be contained inside a cloud. I want it to be uh, not inside the public environment. So this is all what we're doing. All those DevOps agents here, the compute nodes that you see, they're running inside an Azure virtual network that you define. You define that inside the same mechanism, the same configuration mechanisms, and the Terraform code is running as an MSI, which means that you don't have to manage service principle to connect to your environment, which actually at the end of the day means that there's absolutely no secret stored in any part of the code. And that's really important. It's all descriptive. Even if the code is being leaked, there's absolutely nothing uh, uh, that would allow anyone to connect to the environment because everything is being uh, automated, dynamic security, descriptive. And the way you define the configuration with the least privilege principle is all in a descriptive language. So same thing, my MSI privilege, I describe it as I am describing the rest of the configuration. And you see on the left-hand side of the screen is the pipelines technique. You know, of course, here I put the example with Azure DevOps, but those pipeline runners or agents, as we call them, there could be triggered by any other CI CD techniques. So GitHub Actions or many other solutions on the market that you can use. Since we're using a container, remember, we are able to transition super fast and having the container being launched by a runner in any of the CI CD technique. Another advantage of the runner, of the running everything with the router. So this is how it looks like. And if you look at uh, a portal uh, inside Azure DevOps um, uh, pipeline, this is how you see it. And this is how you see the materialization here of the different uh, levels. Now, what you see is the out of the box uh, uh, pipelines that we provide you with. And all the things that I showed you actually is already automated with Terraform as well. So even the creation of the pipelines. So if you see, we automate the creation of the automation. So this is what you get out of the box. And of course, uh, it is a foundation for you to compose out of that, to create new uh, ways to inspect the code, new ways to validate the code. Then your imagination is the limit. So this is really the framework. And then you customize the framework to what maps your organization controls and criteria. And just an example here, you see that having this pipeline that has run that has satisfied the technical criteria, no, I need an approval. And this, I can send even a pop-up into Teams to say, hey, uh, this pipeline needs your approval. Are you okay? Yes, no, with a comment. And that's how uh, we are basically having these slipstreams slip operations inside the organizations. Another important criteria that we're seeing with our customer is the inner source. And this is obviously something that has accelerated with us and with uh, uh, Microsoft and GitHub uh, strategy uh, together it is really what we are all about. People telling, yeah, I want to go faster, even faster than fast. Even this is going very fast, but I want to go faster. So how do I go super fast? And I want to have an AKS blueprint that I'm able to plug directly on top of my core landing zone. I want to have a Windows virtual desktop blueprint, that same thing comes as a criteria and as something that I stitch just on top of all these core engineering uh, components that you showed me. The hub and spoke, the foundation to create the subscription, the guardrails, etc. This is exactly what we're doing. So same thing, you'll see more and more uh, landing zone uh, coming up and that you're able to directly uh, take from the GitHub repository and let's say uh, have the AKS uh, uh, secure landing zone where you have everything automatically and already composed for you. As I was mentioning, my AKS uh, controller defining the number of hosts uh, I, I want, the, my node pools, my node, pool, my node identity configuration, my uh, uh, inbound uh, traffic inspection, my different ingress controllers, etc. All of those components being already ready to use for you and you can compose and modify the configuration. This is really one important aspect, the inner sourcing of the components. 
So here we go. This is how you deploy uh, AKS, Secure Baseline, on top of uh, Azure, inside Cloud Adoption Framework uh, landing zone. Even outside, you can see in uh, the instruction that you can use it absolutely uh, anywhere. So Kafka Terraform landing zone, really what's important that we, that we have seen working with our customer. It's a way to really change the way you are operating, change the way you are introducing changes in the cloud. The new way of working is very important and it's really enabling uh, agility, quality release of anything you will deploy in the cloud. It's really allowing you to start fast because we see people across the world trying to get those foundations right and there's no right or wrong answer. There's a lot of variations around that. But what we really found is that there's certainly a code base, a set of stuff that we can start from and then you get the customization going. Don't have to reinvent the wheel, build on what's there. Leverage what's best practice in a box and get started and get innovation happening fast. Your terms, what makes sense for you as a technology choice on top of Azure, we're here to support you. And judge by yourself, everything is there. Uh, AK.ms, CAF, uh, TF landing zone. And this is where you can find, you can get started with the repo. There's a starter with the configuration file. And in a matter of hours, all the things I show you in the screen, you're ready to go, you're ready to deploy, and you're ready to DevOps. Thank you so much. Uh, there's still a little bit more space for some uh, questions. Thanks for your attention uh, again, and see you soon uh, on another Azure webinar.